Standing here in your presence In a grace so relentless I am one Oh, by perfect love Right within the arms of heaven In a peace that lasts forever Sinking deep in mercy seat I'm one Drawing closer by grace and all my is yours. All fear removed. I breathe you in. I lean into your love. Oh, your Captivated by the splendor of your face Oh, my secret place I'm wide awake Drawing closer by grace And all my heart is yours All fear removed I breathe you in I lean into you Drawing closer by grace and all my heart is yours Oh, fear removed, I breathe you in, I lean into Christ would have we Oh my God, what have we become? Hi there, Pastor Tim Peck here from Glenkirk Church. Christian author Dallas Willard used to say that everyone receives a spiritual formation just like everyone gets an education. The real question is whether it's a good one or not. All of us have been spiritually formed by a variety of influences, some of them good and some of them not so good. In Christ's famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus invites us to be reformed in our spiritual lives. Some call this process discipleship. Here at Glenkirk, we call it becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus. And starting Sunday, September 3rd, we start our fall series through the Sermon on the Mount. And we're calling this series Reformed. 
For 12 weeks, we'll explore ways we've already been spiritually formed. And then hear Jesus' invitation to be reformed in some new ways. And one week into the series, we're going to start eight-week discipleship groups. These groups will start the week of October 2nd and finish the week before Thanksgiving. Each group will work through a small group study guide based on the previous Sunday's message and then meet to talk about the ways God is leading them to be reformed as disciples. If you're serious about discipleship, I hope you join us because we can't do it alone. We need each other along the way. I hope you'll consider joining one of our reformed discipleship groups. And I hope you'll join us on this live stream each week to learn more about how to be reformed by Jesus. God bless you and thanks for listening. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Would you stand as we begin our service with some singing this morning? When we gather together, we're reminded of God's goodness to us and his faithfulness and his love for us and the gift that we have from him in Jesus Christ. And as we sing this morning, um, be reminded by the people around you, this church, as we sing his praises, that he is good and his word is true and we can thank him and we can trust him. Let's sing this morning. I've heard a thousand 
thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I heard the tender whisper of love in dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never
God really loves us. Hallelujah. Oh, praise my soul. God really loves us. God really loves us. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Everything around me is shaking. Oh, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense, so I won't go going under. I'm not held by my own strength, cause I build my life on Jesus. He's never
time I want to invite all the kids up through fifth grade and high school and middle school students. You can head out to Sunday school. God bless you as you go. And everybody else, take a second, say hello to the people around you while you find your seats. Good morning. 
Good morning, and we are thankful to have each of you with us this morning, whether you are here in person or worshiping from home. We would love to hear from you on our connection card found in the bulletin or online. You can also access the connection card, submit prayer requests, and request information through the Glenkirk Church app. We would especially love to hear from you if you are new today, and I'd like to invite everyone with us in person to tear off their connection card and place it in the offering plate during our offering this morning. Um, this week, we celebrated the kickoff to our midweek programming. Um, thank you to all of the volunteers, staff, and families that participated, Women's Bible Study, Choir, Awana, and Middle and High School Engage, and our Belong class ushered in the fall season here at Glenkirk. For the next two weeks in our adult Sunday class, Dr. Yuni Lee from APU will guide us through the theology of Ecclesiastes. Um, this group is meeting in room 22 um, at 1045. Um, also, save the date for our healing prayer service, September 24th at 530 p.m. This service is for those looking for physical, emotional, and relational healing. Elders and pastors will be available for prayer and anointing of oil. A live stream option will be available for those to attend who are unable to attend. Um, and last week, uh, Glen Kirk and the surrounding neighborhood lost power, which resulted in a disruption to our internet on this campus. Um, because of that, we weren't able to print today's bulletins, and we want to publicly thank Cornerstone Bible Church in Glendora and their leadership for printing today's bulletins for us. Um, we really value the relationships with the other local churches in Glendora that we forged. This is a sign that God is working in our community. And now is the time um, of our service when we worship through giving. To support the ministry of Glenkirk and our ministry partners, you can put your offering in one of the envelopes in the pews. I also invite everyone to drop their connection cards into the offering plates as they come by as well. You can also give on the Glenkirk website app or using our text to give feature. Now as the ushers um, come forward to receive this morning's offering, let's worship God with thanks and praise for all God has done with, for us. Almighty God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and worship you. We are grateful for Glenkirk and the many opportunities we have for fellowship and to grow in the faith. 
We gather this morning to reflect, to receive your grace and mercy, and to pray for your strength and wisdom. We pray that you would help us to love each other and to be a light for a world in need of your grace. And for those who are even at this moment facing difficult challenges, we pray for their well-being and that we are all reminded of your call to discipleship and service to one another as you intended through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If it's been a dream
do you deal with your anger? A few months back, I received a text from our neighbor in Bakersfield. Leif and I still own our home there, and we rent it out, actually, to a pastor's family. And our, this house has this big, beautiful tree in the front, which if you've ever been to Bakersfield, you know is worth its weight in gold because Bakersfield is really hot, and that tree provides a lot of shade for the house. But our neighbor was texting me because evidently our big, beautiful tree was growing over onto her property. And her text was less than friendly, it contained interesting language, and more than one threat that if we didn't trim our tree in a certain amount of time, she would report us to the HOA or even bring in the police. This was the first time I'd heard from that neighbor in over a year and the only time she's ever talked to us about the tree being an issue. So this was a really startling text to receive. It was clear from her text that she was very angry with me. And as I started to read it and reread it, I could feel the anger bubbling up inside of me as well. And the more I thought about it and the more I talked to Leaf about it, the more the anger was bubbling up. She didn't need to be so rude about it, anger. Just pick up the phone and call me, lady. Resentment. She really shouldn't treat people like that. More anger. How dare she be angry with me? More resentment. And the more I thought about it, the more it came to a head. My anger grew until I was in this anger spiral. Have you ever been there? How do you deal with your anger? Relationships are complicated. And anytime there are people involved, there's potential for conflict. And when that conflict leads to anger and resentment, what are we to do with that? How are we supposed to deal with our anger? We are in a series called Reformed, where we take a deep dive into Jesus's most famous teachings in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 through 7 because we've all been formed in some way by this world around us. But as disciples of Jesus, we are called to be reformed by the teachings and example and image of Jesus. Two weeks ago, Pastor Tim kicked off this series by taking a look at the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, verses one through 12. And he talked about how Jesus wants to reform our values, changing us from people who value the things of this world, like power, and strength into people who value things of the kingdom of God, like meekness and mercy. Last week, we looked at Matthew 5, 13 through 20, and learned that Jesus wants to reform how we think of influence. Because this world has formed us into people who seek power and prestige, so we can influence a lot of people for our own gain. But Jesus wants us to be reformed into people who seek discipleship, truly changed lives that may not reach a big group of people, but can influence those around us for God's good. This week, we are continuing our series through the Sermon on the Mount as we look at how Jesus calls us to reform our relationships, specifically what to do when we have anger and resentment towards others. So if you are able, would you stand for the reading with God's word from Matthew 5, 21 through 26? Hear the word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you into court. Do it while you are still together on the way. 
or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown in prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Our passage this morning is the first of six topics that Jesus addresses in chapter five, where he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, Biblical scholars call this the antithesis. And the idea is that antithesis is something that is in direct opposition to something else, some things that are complete opposites of one another. And so the classic understanding of Jesus' teaching here and for the next five topics he addresses is that Jesus is teaching something different and in opposition from the Old Testament law and prophets. It looks a little something like this where Jesus's teachings have two main elements, the traditional law and prophets that he quotes, and then his teaching. And these are in opposition to one another. But if we're not careful, in the words of Eric Barreto, professor at Princeton University, we may mistakenly hear Jesus proclaiming, you have previously heard this commandment, but now I'm setting you a new one. For the law was inadequate, insufficient, and is thus now no longer applicable, and here is a whole new set of laws. But as Pastor Tim explained last week, in the verses just before this passage, Jesus says, do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. If Jesus hasn't come to abolish the law, then why do we insist on seeing his teachings as opposite of it? I think some of the reason for this can be traced back to the way we translate this word to fulfill and how we understand that. Pastor Tim touched on this a bit last week, but it's really important for our passage this morning and I think worth reiterating. Jesus fulfilling the law doesn't mean that it is over and now it's done with. Jesus fulfills the law because Jesus perfectly obeyed what the law required and he revealed the true intent of the law. Here's another way to look at it. The Greek word that we translate as to fulfill is actually the word plerao, and it literally means to fill, to fill up. This word is found elsewhere in the gospels, and that might give us a clue to better understand it. In John 12, three, Mary anoints Jesus's feet with perfume, and the scriptures say that the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The house was plerao with the fragrance. In Matthew 15, 37, the feeding of the multitude, after everyone had eaten, they gathered what was left over and it was seven baskets full. Seven baskets plerao of the broken pieces of bread and fish. So what this word means is that there was something like a house or baskets and something else came along that perfectly fit within those things, like the fragrance of perfume or the leftover pieces of bread and fish. So this word really is this idea of something that exists and something else that fills it. Dr. Steve Mann at APU Seminary has a visual that I found really helpful for this. Let's pretend that this vase is the Old Testament law and prophets, the Old Testament scriptures. And Jesus comes along and Jesus is the water. And Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come to fill them. I have come to play rao. So rather than understanding that Jesus is saying he's come and fulfilled the law, meaning he's completed it and it's finished and it's done with, we understand that Jesus is coming saying he filled up the law. He filled it out. He colored it in. He's showing us the true form of the law, the true capacity of it. Just because the vase was filled with water doesn't mean that the vase is now done with. It means that the water now shows us the vase's true capacity and form. Jesus's ministry fits perfectly within the law, 
So much so that if you don't understand what the law and prophets are doing, you won't really understand what Jesus is doing. And on the other hand, if you don't recognize what Jesus is doing, that shows you never understood the law and the prophets. That was the problem for the Pharisees. They were supposed to be these experts in the law, but they didn't understand what Jesus was doing, which showed they didn't really understand it at all. So coming back to our scripture this morning, what are we supposed to do then? How are we supposed to understand Jesus' teaching of, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Pastor Tim and I have been impacted by two Fuller Seminary professors, David Gushy and Glenn Stassen, for pointing out that each time Jesus references the Old Testament here, he presents not a twofold teaching, but a threefold teaching. First, Jesus quotes an Old Testament command. Then he describes a malforming cycle, a pattern of behavior that often leads people to break that command. And then he gives what might be called a reforming practice, a reforming practice that leads people to be reformed and live out the spirit of the law. So here in Matthew 5, the Old Testament command Jesus quotes is the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. By repeating it, Jesus reiterates the importance of it. The malforming cycle or the pattern of behavior that often leads people to break that command begins with anger. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, is in danger of the fire of hell. In other words, anger that is left unchecked escalates. It builds, it spirals out of control until it is taken out on those around us. Jesus uses the example of violent language towards someone. And I think we all know that words can be a form of violence. There's a reason we call it stabbing someone in the back or murdering someone's record, reputation or killing their confidence or cutting them down to size. Words can cause injury that hurt just as much as physical wounds. And that same anger that leads us to violent words can also lead us to violent action and even murder if it goes undealt with, unchecked. So what are we to do? How do we get out of this vicious cycle? Well, thankfully, Jesus also includes this reforming practice. And it's called a practice because you have to practice it. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there. First, go and be reconciled to them. Be reconciled. Go make it right. Go apologize and do it quickly. Don't let your anger build and boil up. Don't stoke the fire and let it keep going. Just go make it right. Jesus is here taking this Old Testament command of do not murder, the vase of the command, and he's filling it up. He's filling it out. He's coloring it in to show us that we are called to live lives of reconciliation. He's showing us that as the people of God, if we simply think do not murder means don't take someone else's life, we are missing the point. If we think that is whatever we do up to the point of taking someone's life is honoring to God, then we have really got it wrong. Our angry words attacking other people's character and reputation, they don't represent God or God's will. Our denomination has a great way of putting this. If you've been through the Belong class in the last year or so, you would have read this in the class. Or if you are in the class now, we read this this past Wednesday. But ECO, our denomination, explains the sixth commandment this way. Do not murder. In other words, eradicate a spirit of anger, resentment, callousness, violence, or bitterness. Eradicate it and instead cultivate a spirit of gentleness, kindness, peace, and love. Recognize the image of God in every person. So do not take someone's life. That, that might be the, the rough outline, the vase of the commandment. But when it's filled up 
and it's colored in and it's filled out, we see the bigger picture that we are called to live lives of reconciled relationships, of cultivating gentleness and peace and love in our relationships, of recognizing and honoring the image of God in every person we interact with. This threefold pattern of Jesus' teachings in Matthew 5 shows us the Old Testament command is still valid, do not murder. There is a malforming cycle, an anger spiral that can lead us to break that commandment. But there is a reforming practice, a way out, a way of reconciliation. Jesus is laying out a Christian ethic of reconciled relationships, the way we are to interact with everyone that we meet. Our relationships with others should not be marked by violence or anger or harsh words or bitterness. No, our relationships with others should be marked with love and gentleness and kindness and peace, genuine reconciliation because you are made in the image of God and so is everyone else that you will ever meet. How do you deal with your anger? It's a legitimate question at this point, I think, to ask, so is Jesus saying we should never be angry? Is that the main takeaway from this passage? Throughout the Bible, there are many references to God's anger. The wrath of God is a phrase you find all over the Old Testament, and it's God's response to the things of this world, like violence, like taking advantage of the poor, like injustice and people harming one another, these behaviors stir up the wrath of God. And the the New Testament tells us that Jesus was also angry when he saw that people were taking advantage of the poor and profiteering in the temple courts. Ephesians 4 tells us, be angry, but do not sin. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Psalm 4, 4 through 5, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices to the Lord. Scripture seems to differentiate anger from sin. So as Jesus saying here, do not be angry, that anger is a sin or that anger is the equivalent to murder, I don't think so. We can't help but be angry sometimes. This world is full of injustice and unfairness and hypocrisy and violence. Anger is a natural response to those things. Sometimes being angry simply means that we are paying attention. If we look to Jesus' teaching in this outline of the threefold pattern, then we see that Jesus' solution that he gives to do not murder is not do not be angry. Jesus is saying, do not murder. There's a malforming cycle, this pattern of behavior of anger that spews anger on others. But the reforming practice here is go be reconciled. It's the command that Jesus gives. The point, the takeaway from this passage is go be reconciled. Jesus isn't saying don't be angry. He's saying, when you are angry, deal with it. Be careful not to fall into the malforming practice of lashing out on those around you, calling them names, attacking their character. Don't brood and let your anger grow and grow. Don't feed it and stoke the fire. Don't let anger take the reins. Deal with your anger before your anger deals with you. Anger is not a sin but it can easily lead to it. So deal with it. Recognize your anger. Pay attention to it. Learn from it. Get help with it. Deal with your anger before your anger deals with you and you take it out on other people. But when you do, go be reconciled. Make it right. Apologize. Because it is in the seeking of reconciliation that we are reformed to the ways and character of God. 
It is in seeking reconciliation that we become the people of God's reconciliation. This is a really difficult lesson, (laughs) but it's an important one because here's the truth. We are going to let one another down. In friendships, in marriage, in church, at work, in families, We are going to hurt each other. There is going to be conflict somewhere, sometime. It's going to happen. But what we do in response to that conflict, that shows who we are and whose we are. Is our response to conflict giving in to anger? Or is our response to conflict a reflection of the God of reconciliation? And I wanna point out something here. This passage is not necessarily speaking to us when someone else has harmed us. This passage is not necessarily speaking to us when we are the ones who are offended. This passage is speaking to us when we are the ones in the wrong, when we have done something against someone else. Jesus does in fact speak to the other side of this when he speaks about revenge, but. That's in a few passages, and you're going to have to wait a few weeks for that one. But notice the language in this passage. To anyone who says raka, to anyone who says you fool, if you remember that someone has something against you, this passage is speaking to us when we have done the offending. And in case we have any doubt about that, Jesus speaks about being found guilty, being handed over to the judge and the jailer and being made to repay and make it right. This passage is about us when we have done wrong, when we have hurt someone. How are we to act when we are called out, when someone shows us how we have hurt them? Are we going to respond in anger? Or are we going to deal with our anger and seek reconciliation? And I have to admit that until preparing for this sermon, I never noticed that about this passage. It actually took me speaking this out loud to someone else for them to show me, hey, that's actually, that's actually not about revenge or forgiveness. <laughs> that's a different topic. I have never noticed that because I always assumed this passage was speaking to me when I had been wronged. Because I'm not, I'm not the villain in the story, right? I'm not the one who, who causes other people to hurt. When, when we read a story, we really identify with either the victim or the hero, right? We don't identify with the person who's done wrong but it's speaking to me when I have hurt someone, speaking to us when we have hurt someone. But that takes a brain shift, I think. (laughs) All too often we view ourselves as the victims because this world has formed us into people who can't even see when we have wronged someone else. The world teaches us, don't ever admit you're wrong. Don't show weakness, don't apologize. Sure, I may have done something super small to someone, but did you see what they did to me? Can you believe they did that? How dare they act like that? I'm offended that they're offended. I'm really the victim here. And eventually when we deny our own wrongdoing long enough, we begin to believe it. We believe that we can do no wrong. We become unable to see when we have hurt other people, unable to grasp the reality of it. And if we cannot see when we've hurt someone, how can we ever be agents of God's reconciliation? How can our relationships ever be reconciled? In this passage, it is the responsibility of the person who has done wrong to go and make it right. So if we can't admit that we've ever done wrong, how will it ever be made right? How can we ever be a people whose relationships are marked by reconciliation if we are not first a people who can listen to the hurt of others and admit when we were wrong? Because as mad as I was at that neighbor who sent me this unnecessarily mean text, as mad as I was at her, 
for threatening me and my family as much as I wanted to make her out to be the bad guy in that whole situation, the reality is my tree was on her property causing her issues. Even though I didn't know about it, even though I didn't even live there anymore, even though I didn't mean to offend her, as angry as I got reading and rereading that text and talking to Leaf about it and thinking about it and brooding over it and letting my anger boil up, in reality, if she had reported me to the HOA, I would have been found guilty and would have been required to trim my tree. It didn't matter I didn't know. It didn't matter how insignificant I thought her complaint was. I was still guilty. And like the person in our passage, she would have taken me to the court and I would have been found guilty and been forced to repay it. And as silly as this example is, it paints the picture, doesn't it? Does that mean she was justified in speaking to me that way? Does that mean she can do whatever she wants because I was the one who offended her first? I think those are the wrong questions. I am still called to live as a person of reconciliation regardless of how my neighbor acts. No matter what she says to me, regardless of her stuff, I am called to own my stuff. And I need to do whatever it is to make it right. I don't always live up to this, but I take comfort in the fact that when I try, when I'm angry, but I pause and stop and slow down and deal with it and then try to make it right, I take comfort in the fact that in those moments, God is reforming me into the person that God wants me to be. That gives me hope that I might not always be stuck in the same place that I am now because that is the implied promise in this passage, that we are not left alone to deal with our anger, that God works through us, that this reforming practice is how God works through us as we seek to make things right, as we seek reconciliation. Jesus says, do not murder and avoid the anger spiral and go and be reconciled. And when we practice reconciliation, especially against those we have hurt, that is where we are reformed as the people of God. Reconciliation is a spiritual practice through which God reforms us. So Jesus' command isn't do not be angry, it's go be reconciled. Are we people of reconciliation? Are we people who listen to the hurt of others and recognize when we're wrong and deal with our anger before it deals with us? Or are we known as people who give in to our anger, who take our anger out on everyone around us using harsh words and name calling, cutting them down to size? If someone was to look at our lives from a completely objective perspective, what would they see in how we interact with one another, in the posts we share on social media, in the way we act in traffic, <laughs> in the way we handle conflict or when we are called out in our own behavior? Jesus says, do not murder, deal with your anger, go and be reconciled. May we be a people who deal with our anger before it deals with us. May we be a people who not only follow the, the rough outline, the vase of the law, but who recognize the full intent of it. May we be a people marked by the spirit of reconciliation that Jesus calls us to. May we be a people who are reformed by the power of God at work in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are humbled by the words in this passage. We are humbled by your challenge to reconcile what we have made wrong. And we recognize our weakness and inability to do that by ourselves, and we pray your presence in our lives. Be with us, Jesus. We love you, and it is in your name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Would you stand with us? Let's sing this last song as a response to the word this morning. for worshiping with us today. As a reminder, our seven-week discipleship season starts in two weeks. And if you'd like to be a part of that, you're not already a part of a small group, we have a table outside. We'd love for you to sign up. We'll get you involved in a discipleship group. We have one almost every day of the week, so there's something there for everyone's schedule. And if you are struggling with something and you need prayer, there's gonna be some elders up here on the left of the platform after service to pray with you. You don't need to carry that alone. And now hear this benediction as a blessing on your week. May the boundless grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you, bringing forth a reforming beyond measure. May the chains of anger shatter in the name of Jesus, setting you free to be who God created you to be. May Jesus guide even your most difficult relationships. And may you find solace in knowing that in every act of reconciliation, you mirror the divine. For through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are reconciled to God. May we be a living testament to the power of Jesus's reconciliation in the world. Amen? Amen. Go in peace.
cross for me But it ends with a bride and groom In a wedding by a glassy sea Oh, death, where is your sting? Cause I'll be there singing Holy, holy oh, Holy is the Just a 